Hi there. On behalf of the Purposeful Project, I want to welcome you to What is SEO? My name is Morty Oberstein. I'm the head of the SEO branding at Wix, and I'm a serial SEO podcaster. I host the Serps Up podcast, the SEO Ramp podcast. I do Edge of the Web's news podcasts on a weekly basic, on a basis, and I am also a communications consultant for SEMrush, which is an SEO um, tool. What the heck is SEO? And why should you care? I'm sure some of you may have heard about SEO. It's one of those things I try to tell my father what SEO is. He has absolutely no clue what I do. You know, I do things with computers. So SEO is one of these weird things that you kind of maybe have a sense of what it is, but maybe you don't. So let's kind of dive into what it is and why you need it. So why you need it is TLDR, SEO or organic search is one of those weird places on the web where you can acquire long-term stable growth. And you'll often see SEO professionals sharing, you know, quick, there's these, we call them hockey stick charts. It's flat, 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 flat. And then boom, all of a sudden you have an explosion of traffic. That's generally not SEO. And it's usually not good SEO. Good SEO, good search engine optimization allows you to produce stable growth over time. It looks sort of like this chart. It's, you know, there are peaks and there are valleys, but it's pretty, you know, continuous and it's pretty stable and it's long it should be long lasting obviously nothing is guaranteed forever and there are updates of google's algorithm which we'll talk about later but as a rule the value of organic search and seo is that it's long-term stable growth coupled with the fact that it builds loyal audiences and i'll compare it to ppc generally speaking people click, you know you click on an ad it's pretty utilitarian i am here to use and abuse you i don't care about your website I don't care about your brand. I don't care who you are, what you do. I just want to buy. That's why I'm clicking on the ad. And then when I'm done buying, I am done with you. I compare organic, when you find a website through organic search, I kind of compare it to finding a good movie. Like, wow, that was unexpected. I found a great website, totally unexpected. And just like you find a good movie, wow, that director, what else did they direct? That actor, uh, what else were they in? And you start exploring other things related to that movie. You explore other areas of the website. So you land on a blog post. Now you might explore their products because that was a great blog post. They're selling this. Huh? Well, if that blog post was great. I wonder if their products are great. I just found a great place for a product. I'm going to keep coming back here. So SEO was about long-term stable growth with loyal audiences. And it's so unique because most of the time, that's not how the web works. So now exactly, you know, what is SEO? And you're going to have different SEOs telling you different things. And if I show this to 10 different SEOs, I would get 11 answers different from what I'm about to tell you. But to me, SEO fundamentally is SEO is a process. The only time I'll read from my slides. SEO is the process of getting Google and lesser search engines um, to understand that your site is really relevant and trustworthy, but really trustworthy for whatever it is your site does. If your site sells shoes, if your site sells pizza, whatever your site does, you want search engines to understand that your site is really, really relevant to that topic. And it's really, really trustworthy for users to learn more, buy more, whatever it is that you do about that topic. That's fundamentally SEO. And it sounds like completely overly simplified. And it is overly simplified because it's way more complicated than that. And what I'm going to try to do over the next 20 minutes or so is give you a general overview and general taste of the structure of what SEO is to give you a framework of perhaps getting and dabbling, getting started in SEO. So there are two phases of search engine optimization. And one of it has to do with your site being discoverable. In other words, yes, you created content on your website, but can Google find it? And now once Google has found it, is it visible? Meaning is Google serving it on its result page to other people, to users, to people who are potential customers and, and so forth. So when we say, is your site findable? What exactly do we mean by that? How do you, what are you talking about? Can Google find you? And how does that process work? Fundamentally, what we're talking about is Google has bots, Google's programs, and they go out <clears throat> and they read web pages. And after they go and they read the web page, Google has to make a decision. Do we say, the page was crap and we do nothing with it? Or do we say the page was great, let's store it. And this is what we call crawling when the page, the, when the bot goes down and reads a web page or the code on the web page, and indexing when they store it in their data center. And all of this, by the way, is very, very expensive, which is going to come into play later on. Um, 
But basically, this is what you want. You want Google to be able to find your website and the web pages on it, read those pages, and then store it in the index so they can serve it up to users whenever they search for something that's related to your website. So your website is read, it's stored, it's ready for, for ranking. That's one half of the equation. Oops, backwards, sorry. The question is, who cares? Great, so Google goes out there, reads web pages, it stores the web pages in an index, and it serves them on the results page when someone's searching for something related to whatever that content is. What do I have to do with that? And the answer is a lot. So for example, first thing is you can create a site map. And a site map is literally what it says. It's a map of your site. You're telling Google here are the important web pages on my, on my site. Not all of the pages go into your sitemap. Um, for example, archive pages don't need to be in the site. They're archived. You're telling Google, here are the pages. And not only are you telling Google, here are the pages, you're telling Google when they were last modified. So Google knows, wait a second, you just updated all of your blog posts a week ago. We have to crawl that. We have to read that again and store it again because perhaps you add new relevant information. If you don't know how to create a sitemap, well, first, if you're using a platform like Wix, we do it automatically. We submit it automatically. You don't have to do anything. If you're not, just know that these things exist and you need to create one, take that with your developer and make sure that you have one and make sure that you submit it to Google, particularly to Google Search Console. Because it's one thing to have the sitemap, but if you don't let Google know that it exists, now what? So you need to let Google know, hey, I have this sitemap. Come check it out. Here are the pages that you need to find. Um, you're like, submit to search what? Search Console. Search Console is a Google property. It is a tool, basically. And in this tool, you can see things like how many people click to your website from Google. How many times have people seen your URLs from the Google results? Um, which pages are, which pages are not indexed in Google's index? When you when you interact with Search Console, one of the things you can do is submit your sitemap to let Google know here are the pages. Come find them, read them, store them. Another great way for getting Google to know and discover the pages that you have is internal linking. It's one of the me the most important SEO tasks you can do. It's also one of the easiest things you can do. And if you don't know what internal linking is, let me show you what internal linking is. This is internal linking. This is the Wix SEO Learning Hub. It's the this is the homepage for the hub, and we have a whole bunch of links to other posts, to posts that we have on the hub. These posts are links from one web page on my domain from another web page on my domain. So you're linking to your own pages. This helps Google discover the pages on your website. Google lands on this page here, the, the home page for the Wix SEO Learning Hub. It sees all these other links to the particular blog posts that we have. And it says, hey, there are all these links here. Let's follow them. Let's actually go to these other pages and see what's there. Because Google's on a hunt to discover new content. If it, linking from one web page to another web page on my own website, once Google gets to that first web page, it'll see the links and it may elect to go read those links and then crawl and index them. Just to give you an example, within an actual blog post, so I wrote a blog post about how do you rank a podcast. Of course, I link to my own podcast on the same website. When If Google were to come to this blog post, it would see a link to the Serps Up podcast. Let's assume for a minute it never knew that this podcast page existed before. It says, oh, wait a second. There's a link to that podcast page. Let's go to that podcast page. Maybe that's a page of good content that we should be indexing. In theory, this would be a way for Google to discover the fact that this website has a podcast page and for Google to read, to crawl, and then store and index that page. Another great way for getting Google to discover and to realize the content that you have on your website so that it can find it, crawl, and say, this is great, let's store it, is external links. External what? External links. Similar to internal links, but it's when one website, not your own, links to your website. So let's assume again, for example, that Google had no idea that my podcast existed. Search Engine Roundtable is linking to it here. Google reads Search Engine Roundtable's page. It then says, hey, there's a link here to this Serps Up podcast thing. 
why don't we go follow that link and see what this podcast page is all about? We like this page. It is good. Let us index it. And that's another way that Google can discover the content on your website. It's all one big network of content out there on the web. Linking, whether internally, external links, helps Google discover new content. And therefore, perhaps index your content and therefore perhaps rank your content, which brings people to your web pages, which gets people to, I don't know, buy stuff from you, which is kind of the point. The content itself, when it comes to crawling Google, reading the pages and indexing them and storing them is extremely important. Forget links for a minute, forget sitemaps for a minute. The content itself plays a huge role and therefore you play a huge role in what Google decides to read and then index. And that content needs to be good. It needs to be unique. For example, okay, I mentioned before that Google does not have unlimited resources. Google is going around and trying like everyone else to save money. Crawling and indexing, reading web pages, sending out these bots, storing it forever, theoretically, is very expensive. So Google is on a, on, on a path to find content, but at the same time is trying to save as much money as possible. So if Google sees two pages on your website that are pretty much the same thing, you know what Google's going to do? They're like, wow, these two pages are the same thing. Why are we storing both of these things? Let's just store one of them. If you want your pages to be indexed, to be stored in their data centers, and therefore being able to serve up to users, because you, again, Google can't serve something it's not storing, make sure that your content is unique. Make sure each page had its own unique value and its own unique angle that it's taking so that if you want it to be in the index and be able to serve up on the results page, that it's be able to do, do, you're able to do that because it's unique content. Make sure that it's well-structured. If Google can't easily understand it, they're going to be like, this is not good. We are not storing it. Part of that is making it explicit so that Google can understand that it is good content because it can actually understand it. And this is done through things like headers. And it's done by things by avoiding jargon and marketing language or it, it, perhaps idioms and metaphors unnecessarily and being kind of explicit because then you're being explicit. You're not relying on Google being able to interpret some poetic thing by Edgar Allan Poe. Google's able to actually understand what the heck you're talking about. Numbered lists, bullet lists, um, bolded text. These are all ways to structure your web pages to help Google understand what's there because Google can't understand it. Why would it index it? Why would it store it? And the last thing I'll say is to be as efficient as possible. Again, Google's on, I'll, I'm going to say this multiple times because it's so important. Google is trying to be efficient with their budget and it's going to be efficient with sending out its bots, reading web pages, and seeing whether or not they should index and store them. And some of the ways, because I'm because again, I'm going to repeat this. They do not have infinite money. They want to save money and they want to be efficient. I will tell you every SEO who's worth their weight is going to tell you that getting your content indexed and having it stayed in Google's data storage centers is much harder than it used to be. Part of the way you can make it efficient for Google is being reliable, meaning when Google sees a link and makes a call to the server, if Google's got to sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait, or maybe get a 500 error, like a 503 error, that's not good. If that keeps happening, Google's like, we're not wasting our time with this web page. We're going to another web page. Uh, things like server side rendering so that Google can get the JavaScript in one shot and be efficient in, in, in how it's crawling a web page. Those things are making it easier on Google, make it easier for Google to crawl and then index your content. If you don't know how to do any of this stuff, that's fine. Just know that it's a thing. And if you're on a platform like Wix, we do it for you automatically. So you don't have to worry about it. If you're not, make sure your developer is on the ball of these two things. Okay, right, let's talk about the second half of SEO. Um, we, we can call it ranking. We can call it traffic. We can call it earning revenue, but it's being visible. It's getting... Google has read your website. It has said the content on your website, it is good. We will store it. But it's one thing for a Google to store it, but it's kind of purposeless if Google's not showing it to other, to other people, i.e. people who are doing searches on Google. So how do you get some visibility for yourself? Which is really what we're asking is, what do you want from me, Google? If you're, Google's gonna, you ever go to Google? Yes. And you ever see where it says, uh, we have your 4 million trillion results in 0.3 seconds. That's a lot of results. That's a lot of competition. How does Google decide which ones to show, which ones not to show up top? 
So we need to understand kind of what Google wants from us. Top level, like, you know, TLDR, what Google wants is really good quality content that's really, really relevant to people. You can even zoom out from that. And what Google wants is a good user experience. What Google doesn't want, let's put it in the negative. Google doesn't want someone going to the results, um, searching for something, seeing the results there, going to a web page and being, well, this stunk. Thanks, Google. Maybe next time I'll use Bing. So Google wants to make sure that the content that it's showing reflects well on itself. There are some basic things that need to happen for Google to think that you're good, for lack of a better way of phrasing that. It sounds childish, but it's kind of what we're talking about. Um, I'll run through them, but these are just the basics. It's kind of what gets you into the stadium, but not onto the field, but you need to have them. Sort of like best practice kind of then going down and using H2s for subheadings. If you have a if you have a section within a section, use an H3. A section within a section within a section, use an H4. Don't go from an H2 to an H6 back to an H3 and then an H1. Logical logical um, page structure, no, sorry, logical site structure is good for users, good for Google. So uh, you know this is a typical pyramid hierarchy. You have your home page. Let's say you have products, and say so you have a blog. You have a folder for products, you have a folder for blog. I know to find the product pages in the product folder. I know to find the blog pages in the blog folder. If I were to find a blog post within the product folder, that would be very confusing. This confusing to your users is also confusing to Google. Logical site structure is a big deal. It makes things easy, easier and more understandable for everybody. URLs, I was debating whether to put this in here. URLs, keywords in the URLs are, are not a major ranking factor. So it's kind of an SEO thing, kind of not an SEO thing, but it's really good for users. So for example, here, semrush.com slash blog, okay, it's their blog folder. The slug is online reputation management. It's pretty simple, easy to understand. I know what I'm getting from this. From the user point of view, it's very digestible. It's very discernible as opposed to having, you know, a slash blog dash, a whole bunch of numbers and parameters. That's not good for anybody. And the keyword in there is a teeny tiny ranking factor. So I guess it's kind of important. Title tags and meta descriptions, like the last of the basics. Um, a title tag. Title tag is a piece of code. It goes in the head element of your web page. And it's basically telling Google, this is the title of the page. Google very often uses this title tag for the title link for the title on the results page. So for example, here I have expand your SEO knowledge, Wix SEO hub. That is the title tag on this web page. Little pro tip, I guess, if you want to see what a page's title tag is, if you're in Chrome, hover over the tab of the web page, that little hover out, that's the title tag. Now, Google does, and more recently, rewrites these title tags, and it doesn't just use them on the results page. It might rewrite them. That's fine. It doesn't really matter from an SEO point of view. From a conversion point of view, it's a different, th a different story. Google still reads the title tag, even if it doesn't use it, when it crawls a web page, it reads the title tag and it uses, it, it's a ranking factor. It's part of what Google uses to understand what the web page is all about. So even though Google might not use the title tag that you write on the, on the results page, it is using it to understand what the heck your page is about. So it's really important to write a title tag. Um, by the way, just so you understand, the title tag and the actual title on the page don't need to be the same. So for example, I can have an actual different, I can have a different H1 for expand your SEO knowledge, Wix SEO hub, which is true. I do have a different H1 on this web page, which makes sense because on the results page, I'm trying to get clicks. On the actual page, you have already clicked. I'm trying to really just you know, double down on the actual understanding of what you're going to get on the web page. So two different intents. So title tags are really important. So are meta descriptions, more so for conversions and for ranking. So the yellow section that I have highlighted here is the uh, meta description. It too is a piece of code that lives in the head element of a web page, but it's a short little description of the web page. So in this case, Wix SEO Learning Hub, get expert advice and yada, 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 yada. This is an opportunity for you to control clicks. If you write a good meta description, it can entice people to click on it and think that your web page is relevant and to click on it from the Google results page. Now, Google does at times or often rewrites the meta description um, as it sees fit, but 
it's a best practice to have one to custom create one because again it's a it's a, it, when it doesn't when google doesn't rewrite it itself it is a way for you to control the narrative and to drive clicks in the way that you want to from the, the results page now like those are just the basic things those are just like you know tldr best practices however google has a very very complex algorithm of how it decides what to rank what to show number one, what to show number two, what to show number three, or what to show number 300, which is not what you want because no one's clicking. The old joke, uh, what's the best place to hide something? On um, page two of Google. Let's talk a little bit more in depth about Google's algorithms and how it decides what to show and what not to show. Just to, so you understand, the, I said before that Google uh, organic search is a great way for long term stable growth. That's not to say, that there are not times where there's volatility. It's as if to say there's not times where there are, you know, downturns in your visibility. So, for example, here, we're looking at the keyword car stereo set. The red, each one of these lines is a URL ranking on the Google results page. So the red line up top is ranking, you know, around in the beginning here, seven, six, seven, eight on the results page. You see towards the middle of the graph, it dips down for a while, then it dips back up, and now it's ranking again six or seven, then it dips back down again. That's not what you want. It's inevitably going to happen, but you don't want it to, like here, happen for a few days. There are times where Google will do an algorithm refresh and update, and it will take what was ranking number one and push it to rank number 100 forever or for many, many months or until you fix something. And that's what you want to try to avoid. And that's what I'm going to teach you the basics of so that you can try to avoid it yourself. So I, I always start off a little bit of a history of the algorithm because it does give you context of what used to work and what does work now and what used to be the right way to go and what is no longer the right way to go. In the beginning, there was PageRank and PageRank is what made Google Google. So you had, you know, back in the day, Yahoo, Alta Vista, um, you know, uh, Yahoo, um, uh, uh, Ash Jeeves, all these search engines that no longer, AOL, that no longer exist, rest in peace. And what they did was they were basically matching keywords. So I searched for uh, best pizza place, New York City. The web page that ranks has best pizza place, New York City, like 500 times stuffed in there. What Google did said, okay, yeah, keyword matching is important. This is, by the way, year, 20 years ago we're talking. But another way, let me put it this way, that helps me understand what this page might be about, but I don't know that it's a good page about a pizza place in New York City. How do I know this is a quality result? And what Google did was look at links. It said, if 10 web pages are linking to this page, that's 10 web people, uh, that's 10 people that think that this page is good. Otherwise, why would they link to it? So this page is about pizza. We get that. But is it a good web page? Yeah. Look at all the links it's getting. So many people are linking to it. That's an affirmation, a testimony to how good it is. That was back in the day. And that algorithm is called PageRank was completely novel. It's what made Google different than everybody. And it's what made the results much better. Now, what did SEOs do? Well, they did this. They started selling links. I don't know if you get these in your LinkedIn. I, as an SEO, I get tons of these. I want to sell you links. Because SEOs are like, well, if Google's looking at links and saying the number of links is what makes your web page better and rank higher, so then we should buy a lot of links. Like, I'll pay you to link to my website. I'm going to pay you, and I'll pay you, and I'll pay you to link to my web page. So what Google did was they released an algorithm update called Penguin. There's multiple iterations of Penguin. It is still part of the algorithm. And what Penguin did at various points was um, to basically like kind of penalize websites that were buying links or had spammy link practices. Today, what it does, it basically says if you have all these bad links, they just completely ignore all, all of them. So you've wasted all your money. You've gotten no value out of it. So then what did SEOs do? Well, when we said, okay, fine, they can't do the link thing anymore. But what we can do is we can create a whole bunch of web pages with not a lot of content on them, spin them up really, really quickly, and get them to rank for a lot of keywords. So if I want to rank for Pizza New York City, I want to rank for Pizza Place New York City, I want to rank for Pizza Store New York City, I want to rank for Pizza with Pepperoni New York City, I'll create really bad web pages for each of those keywords, and I'll rank for each of those keywords, and I get so, so much traffic. So then Google released something called Panda, which is also still part of the algorithm, uh, which basically said, 
if you have thin, unhelpful, spammy content that's not helpful to people, you don't rank anymore. And I know many, 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 many people, their entire businesses were lost because of this update. Now we live in an era of machine learning. Around 2015, Google started to introduce its first machine learning property, which we say is AI, but it's really machine learning. The difference is, well, significant, but we're not going to get into that. Um, it introduced its first machine learning property into the algorithm in 2015. And I don't want to get into all the various machine learning properties that Google's using, all the cool things that they're doing. It's a very, very interesting topic. But in a nutshell, what the machine learning properties help Google do or enable Google to do is basically say, we can be super exact. We can better understand what you're searching for. And we can better understand web content. So now we could be far choosier in what we show because we understand when you search for buy car insurance, we understand all of the implications of what you mean by that. And at the same time, we actually understand the web pages that talk about buying car insurance way better than we used to. So now we can match you and your user intent, what you were looking for, with way better web pages than we were ever able to do before. So we live in an era where Google's way better at understanding content now with machine learning. So we've gone from Google looking at links, saying, wow, so many links must be great, which was novel at the time, to Google doing things around like natural language processing, which is a really fancy way of saying Google understands what the heck the content on your page is actually saying, or what the heck your query that you search for actually means. It kind of means, and many people think about SEO this way, that the era of keywords is over. So back in the day, and I think people still feel this way to a large extent, that SEO is about keywords. Oh, if I want to rank for Pizza New York City, I better make sure I have the keyword Pizza New York City and in my title, in, in, in the first, we say have the keyword in the first line of the first paragraph of your webpage. Uh, have the keyword over here, have the keyword over there. Make sure that exact keyword Pizza New York City is all over the place on your webpage. Not true anymore. Google understands content naturally. It understands content kind of the way we do, which is contextually. It understands the fact that if you're talking about pizza and New York City, you're going to be talking about all these other subtopics, which help Google understand that your content is actually adequately handling the topic. It understands synonyms now. So you don't need to use the exact keyword. You kind of need to write naturally because what other words are you going to use other than words that describe whatever it is you're offering, selling, or talking about. So what exactly, now that you know this, it's great that I know this, but what do I do with this? So some practical advice. One, targeted content. So back in the day, and still today, to a large extent, people on the web would write these ultimate guides to everything. The ultimate guide to vacationing. And they tried to rank for 100 different keywords and get so much traffic. That era is over. Google understands that people want targeted content. People are skeptical. People don't want to rummage around the web. Multiple reasons why, but as, as a whole, as a rule, people expect to get far more targeted content placed in front of them than they used to. Google knows this. Now, Google's able to do this because Google's better able to understand content. So even if you were to search for, we call it a head term or a very top level keyword, best vacation spots, look what Google's doing here. You have a URL um, with a whole in this whole big box. They have a list of you know places, world's best places to visit: um, Paris, Maui, you know, London, Rome, with a URL to U.S. News. But look above that. There's a set of filters there because Google knows you might search for best vacation spots, but you're probably looking for something way more specific than this general list of best vacation spots. You might want a vacation um, at Christmas time because I was I, when I pulled the screenshot, it was Christmas time. You might want to you know go on vacation alone. You want to see what are the best places to go on vacation alone or near you. You want to go on a local vacation, a little break. These filters, if I'm somebody looking for a vacation spot, be like, oh yeah, I do want to go on vacation alone. I'm going to click on that filter. I'm going to ignore all of the results on this page, including the one from US News here. And I'm going to go to a new results page from Google about best vacation spots to go to alone. There are many, 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 many of these kind of filters on the results page because Google knows you search for something general, but you don't want something general. You want something very specific. Do what Google is basically telling you to do, which is write 
specific targeted content for specific answers to specific questions for specific user needs. Be very targeted in who your audience is, what they want, and what their problems that they're facing are, and write that for them. But also make sure that it's substantial in quality. Because again, the days of, you know, eh, meh kind of content, Google is trying to rid the web of this. And it's been doing a pretty decent job since around 2018 in doing this. So make sure that whatever content you're targeting or whatever audience or topic or subtopic you're targeting, that you handle it in a really substantial way, meaning you're offering real value to the user. And also make sure that it's aligned to the user. What do I mean? Make sure it's aligned to user intent. If the users want something that's you know short and sweet, don't write a five-page post. The user looking for you know, a very nuanced, specific piece of information that has a lot of you know context to it. So then write a longer post. Don't offer a short answer. Folks want audio, offer audio. Folks want video, offer video. Uh, targeted content that's aligned to the, what we call the user's intent. Also showcase experience. Google's doubled down. And in the era of AI content, this is super important because going to differentiate, you, differentiate your content for what most of the other people are going to end up doing, which is going to an AI writer. Showcase experience, Google has talked about this multiple times. For example, Google has said that if let's say you're writing a product review page and you're reviewing my, the best microwaves, five best microwaves that you should use, 2023, you actually have to have used those microwaves. And Google's trying to use its algorithm to figure out if you actually use it or not. How is it doing that? Great question, different time, but it's doing that. So if you have actual experience, showcase that experience. Somehow let the user and Google at the same time, obviously, know that you have real experience with this topic or whatever it is that you're talking about. And not just you have experience, but you have expertise because of that experience. So you're showcasing experience, which is not enough because, like, yes, I have a lot of experience with this. Okay, but what does that actually provide me with? What's the expertise that you now have? So in your content, at whatever level is appropriate, Showcase experience, showcase expertise, be targeted, and be aligned with what the user wants to get out of the uh, the content. That's basically that in a nutshell. So much more to get into, but um, I want to touch on a few topics very quickly about SEO. Uh, many of you are in the local space, so let's talk about local SEO really quickly. If I search for pizza in New York City, I like pizza, and I'm from New York, so like that's my go-to query. You'll get a box that looks like this. This is called a local pack. It's not your typical organic result. And in fact, the algorithm that produces these three listings in this little special box is a different algorithm than what produces the typical organic results that we're used to seeing in Google. And it's predominantly because of this thing, the Google business profile. Google looks at the Google business profile and says, hey, Joe's Pizza, which by the way, is showing up number two in this little pack here. Um, Joe's Pizza, oh, how do we know who Joe's Pizza is? Well, Joe's Pizza has an official Google business profile you know, we see where they're located, so we know that they're relevant to New York City because we have their address there. We have 2,500 reviews here, so we know people like them. Optimizing this profile is very important. Google has a lot of documentation on it, so have a look and see. By the way, it applies to brick and mortars. It also applies to service area businesses. So if you're a plumber, it goes around from location to location. You can also set one of these up. Have a look at the Google's documentation about it and go for it. With that, though, Location consistency is super important. Um, if Google sees, for example, that um, on your Yelp listing, your phone number is one thing. On your website, your phone number is something else. Your address is something else. It confuses Google. Make sure your name, business name, address, and phone number are consistent across the web. We call it NAP or NAP. Make sure that's consistent. Otherwise, you'll confuse users and you'll confuse Google, and it won't be good for you. Also, if you have multiple locations, create web pages about those locations. If you have a location in Brooklyn, you have a location in you know, Washington Heights or in Miami, wherever it is, you can create web pages for that. Try to differentiate the page of their local laws that apply differently to New York and Miami. Talk about them. Don't just write the same content for New York as you have in Miami. Try to differentiate and make it unique. Um, now a couple of other really quick random points about SEO. Um, if it's not on mobile, it's not on the web. And this is a really important point. Google has a mobile first index. Google is looking predominantly, not entirely, but predominantly at your mobile version of the page. So if you have content on desktop, but not on the mobile version, Google won't see it. And therefore it won't know that you have it. Therefore it won't know to show it to people who are looking for it. 
So make sure your mobile site is optimized. Performance is kind of, it is a ranking factor. It's a small ranking factor, but it's really important for users. So some really good things that you can do to make sure your site is faster is use one font, not multiple fonts. It slows your site down, believe it or not. Compress the images. Use JPEGs over PNGs. Don't go crazy with the media. Videos, YouTube videos, because everything can slow the page down. Watch out for shifts. It's called cumulative layout shifting. You ever go on a mobile device, you're looking to press a button, and the page shifts around, and you, what you just clicked on is not what you meant to click on, and you just spent 20 bucks you didn't want to spend? That's actually part of the rankings. Don't like check for that. Make sure that's not happening. Also, really annoys users. And pop-ups, interstitials, intrusive interstitials. You can't click the X. That, it, that could theoretically impact your ranking. So don't have those. And they're just annoying. Resources. SEO is a constant journey. Learn more. Where do you learn more? I'm going to say the Wix SEO Learning Hub. Not only because I worked for Wix, because I've written a heap of the content there. So biased because I wrote it. But hey, um, so seroundtable.com is a great way to get updated on the news, which is a great way to learn SEO. Moz has a wonderful beginner's guide. And the SEMrush blog is great for people trying to learn SEO. And if you have questions about SEO or anything I've said today, please, please, please reach out to me. I love Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Morty Oberstein. I'm also on LinkedIn at Morty Oberstein. So please definitely reach out and find me. And that brings us to the end. I hope you enjoy this. Again, please reach out if you have any questions. And I hope you took something away from this. Thank you so much. That was absolutely incredible. I hope everyone just took away so much knowledge from you. Do you have time to answer a couple of questions? Absolutely. Perfect. Do you want to go through them in the Q&A section? Oh, the Q&A, yeah, yeah. Sorry, whoops. Okay. Uh, let's move that over so I can see. Okay. Looking at some of Wix's templates, there aren't any pages, but rather a lone homepage with loads of anchors. Is that okay for Google Bots to find? Yeah, I mean, look, um, it all depends, right? So you have a homepage. That I, there are many, let's say, SEO consultants who only have a one-page website. By the way, we're, we're, I guess I can spoil this. We are just launching anchor text links, meaning that you can have like um, mysite.com um, slash, you know, hashtag about, and it'll, it'll, it'll slide the user to the about section of that one page website. So that's rolled out to 50% of people in English right now on Wix and it's coming to everybody else soon. But yeah, one page website is fine. It all depends on what your content needs are. Um, are social media sites classed as external links? Not really. I mean, Google does look at Twitter. If I prefer your, for like say um, you as a personal person, Google knows that you have a Twitter account. And Google knows that that Twitter account is connected to you. So that is important. In terms of links, no. So if, like somebody links to your website on a Twitter post, that does not count as an actual link. Google doesn't count all links. It's careful what it considers to be just like oh, a link out there on the web or a link that it should consider. Um, keywords spread over various pages on a website is beneficial, detrimental. Will it think the pages are just the same? Artist, artwork, got it. So each page should have an absolute purpose. Now, let's just say you talk about artwork. Having many pages that talk about artwork is a good thing as a rule because that shows you have knowledge about artwork. You'd handle the topic not just one time, but multiple times, meaning Google understands that you're relevant for this concept. As a topic, you're relevant. If you want those pages to be indexed, having a page about like um, Monet's artwork, why it's the best? And then another page like the top Monet's artwork and why it's the best. It's probably the same content. Google's going to look at it and be like, eh, that's the same thing. So you need to make sure that it's, it, and again, a user might be confused. Think about it from the user's point of view. Would a user really think these two pages are the kind of the same or would the user get unique beneficial information out of each one separately? In which case, Google will probably look at it the same way. Are video posts more beneficial over and above written content? Video is great. And I think repurposing things are wonderful. Let's say I have a blog post and I can create a video out of it. Google does show for, I'll give you a great case. We have a blog post on the Wix SEO learning hub about um, homepage SEO. We also have a webinar about it. Google has a section sometimes on result pages that just shows videos. The web page itself doesn't rank, but the video ranks and the video now has like 7,000 views because it ranks well in the Google results page. So it's not a matter of is it more or less beneficial. It's, it, it expands what you're able to be visible for, 
But also, again, if the user is expecting video and that's where they want to find something, so do that for them. It's all a matter of the intent. Is SEO a big factor when choosing tags for YouTube videos? I don't know much about YouTube um, SEO, but I would imagine the tags play a role. Um, I have a five-star review on Etsy. I can link them on my Squarespace site, but will this help my SEO for my own site? I also sell on another site with lots of five-star reviews, but can't link to it. Will it help SEO my company? Um, having First off, having content on the website where you're showing like, let's say you offer medical services and you have, and be careful, there's people that put images and they don't put actual text and Google can't read the, the text in an image. It could just read text. But if assuming that it's actual text and you put up reviews from people, that will help Google realize that you are an actual company that's offering real services that people actually trust. So those things do help. They really help in the Google business profile if you have a local business. That's where they help the most in terms of like reviews and ranking. Uh, last one, with backlinks. What if we wrote articles on LinkedIn or similar platforms? Would that be helpful? Um, in theory, yes. Um, and, and, and let me, let's put it this way. Let's say you wrote an article and, and, and by the way, uh, LinkedIn articles, Google can index LinkedIn just announced, by the way, that you can and create a title, an SEO title, a title tag for LinkedIn articles, not LinkedIn posts, articles, but let's just say you're not running an article. Let's say you uh, wrote a really good post and you link to your website in there. It's like, I, well, you like what I wrote here? Check out my website. And let's just say 10,000 people saw that LinkedIn post. Now, Google didn't because Google's not looking at actual LinkedIn posts. But let's say people saw that post, loved it, saw your website and said, hey, this is a great website. I'm going to link to it from my website. So social media is a great way to get links. So think about social media as a great way to get your name out there. It also really helps getting links because people like your content. They'll link to it, which helps for SEO. And they think that is, oh, no, there are more questions. Okay, sorry. Um, how does Google biz in you now because a client is still waiting for code, which used to come in a letter, but it's been a while I'm lost. So I think, uh, I think you're talking about Google when you're trying to verify a Google business profile, they would mail you a postcard. Now they're doing kind of automatic reviews a little bit. They're doing like video, video verification. So Google needs to know that your business is real and what it'll do is it'll say, how do we know you're real? Well, the address that you gave us will mail you a postcard. Sometimes what they're doing now is they're doing, um, they're doing a, a, you can upload a video where you're showing your storefront, you're showing that you have a, you know, an actual business, all those kind of things, and you're doing it that way. If they haven't got the code, I do have to reach out to Google's um, help directly because I don't know how to get that other than reaching out to Google help. By the way, if you're using Wix and you're in the UK, you can instantly verify through Wix. Uh, okay. Is there a specific ranking fact that I should be looking at in terms of Google, in terms of ranking pages? For example, I'm having a hard time ranking a service base page for a specific location. There are many, many, Google has like 200 ranking factors. Um, I've actually had conversations with people at Google about this. You can, you can try to optimize for a particular ranking factor. It's kind of pointless in, in a lot of ways because Google doesn't say this factor is important. Let's say like, um, uh, the title tag, or let's say having an image on the page is sometimes a ranking factor. Like imagine a recipe page. You're not going to rank if you don't have an image of the food. Does that apply equally to a blog post about astrophysics having an image? No. So the particular factors that Google is using, its algorithm all depends, and it's part of the machine learning, on the query people are looking for. So there's no one thing to focus on. I would focus on having the basics optimized if it's local. And you're trying to get your, your business profile or you're trying to get your business listing listed in that local pack. So reviews, proximity, I mean, how close you are to the location mentioned or the location of the actual person searching. Those are some of the big factors there. Uh, let's see. You mentioned trying to go at many videos. I'm in creative media and video content, so that would be very difficult. Is there a better way to still showcase my work without being penalized? Okay, one thing. It's not a matter of being penalized. Google is not a penalty. An algorithm is not a penalty. There are penalties, like a manual penalty. Google goes, whoa, you're doing some really bad things. We are manually turning the rankings off. This is Google algorithmically deciding which is better, which is worse. Now, with speed, and Google has said this, or performance, it's a tie break, meaning if both pages are equally the best, 
these two pages and one is slightly faster or a better user experience than the other, Google will rank that other one first. That's generally, and many studies have shown this, that's generally not usually happening. I Meaning you don't really have to worry. If your videos are a main part of your website and conversions, you're not going to change that. And that is not an actual expectation that you should be doing. Um, there are things you can be doing, like you can, you know, for example, if you have, like I say, you have a multiple videos, instead of putting them all there, you can have a button, right? That says, uh, see more videos, and it loads more videos afterwards, or it takes you to another web page. So there are things you can do like that. But again, if that's central to your business, don't give up your business for a very teeny, teeny, tiny part of the algorithm. What's more important is good content that speaks to users. Content is always king over things like those kind of factors. Uh, can you tell us anything about AI platforms with develop SEO packages? I don't know exactly what that refers to. Um, Google, they just actually announced this yesterday, uh, two days ago, and Bing announced yesterday. They're putting G, um, um, AI chats into their results pages. I will say about AI content that in the short term, Google might rank it. I think long term, Google is going to be like, this is not really what we want to rank. It's not really unique and they're gonna figure it out. What's the best way to get relevant backlinks? Any hacks? Getting other websites in the niche to link is very difficult. Yes, link building is very difficult. Um, there are some, look, it's very easy to go into the wrong way of thinking about this. What's relevant is, by the way, when it comes to linking, a relevant website that talks that's from a page that's talking about what you're talking about on your page. So it's not just the number of links, it's the quality of those links. and. There are many things you can do for example, if you're a local business, if you go to a fair, a local business fair, and you say, hey, uh, photographer, I'm a wedding hall. Could you list me on your website of like, you know, the top, because if you're a photographer and you, you might have a blog post of like top wedding halls that I work at. Can I be listed there? Because I have a great wedding hall. Check it out. So there are things you can do, and it's very slow going to get relevant links from relevant websites. Um, is Trustpilot Facebook reviews really important to Google? Not directly. Like, it's not a, like they're not going to look at those third parties and use them as a factor, like a ranking factor. I use uh, SEO Yoast to help me with my SEO prompts. Is that still a good tool to use? Yeah, yeah Yoast is great for using WordPress. They're also on Shopify. Yoast is a great tool to use. Um, I wouldn't get hung up. They have like you know, an SEO score, like a smiley face, happy face. I always get like a, a, a red face around some of the things around sentence structure because Yoast thinks, okay, um, search engines want really quick, short snippets of content. So you don't want really long run on sentences. But, and I come from a content background, I like to be very verbose and my sentences are usually more complex. So I get bad scores on my Yoast. I don't worry about that. I ignore that. If I own over 100 geoloca geolocalized one page lead generation websites around the UK, I guess I need, oh, I need to vary the content. Otherwise I may get flagged. Would you not advise doing it? Well, just like if you're if it's you're you're competing against yourself at that point, and why Google's going to be like, hey, this page, that page, they're exactly the same. They might be able to figure out, by the way, that you're kind of the same person. It doesn't seem to me like a viable strategy. So that's all I'll say about that. And I think that does it for all the questions.